Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second part of my presentation on the third package. I'd like in the second part to go into some of the details of uh, the third package rules, and I particularly want to talk today about the principle of third party access, what that means, why it's important, and then I want to look at a second principle known as unbundling, which is very important for the way that transmission system grids and distribution system grids are operated. So let's begin by looking at the principle of third party access. Why is this such a key principle in European internal energy market legislation? Well, the answer is that electricity grids, networks and gas pipelines are what we call essential facilities. Essential facilities in the sense that any company or market actor wanting to access customers obviously have to use these pipelines or transmission grids to supply the gas or the electricity in question to final customers. So without access, they cannot reach new markets. Now, previously, pipelines and electricity networks were usually owned by companies who also produced and supplied energy. So they weren't terribly keen to allow third parties, in other words, competitors, access to their networks uh, because in doing so, they would be effectively giving away a bit of their markets. And so without rules and regulations to force them, to compel them to give access, then it was going to be very difficult to make this concept of an internal energy market really take off. So even in the first and second packages, which preceded the third package, which we are talking about today, the principle of third party access was firmly anchored. What has happened over the years as these packages have developed is that the principle has become stricter and there are fewer possibilities to give any exemptions from the requirement to allow competitors access to a network. So third party access means then that anybody wanting to supply electricity or gas to customers or to uh, distribution companies to supply in an area should give access to those companies in order to let them trans transport their energy. And the idea being behind third party access then is that the terms and conditions on which that access is granted have to be fair and reasonable. And these terms and conditions will be supervised by national regulators. And I'll talk a little bit more about the role of national regulators in the next part of this presentation. But what I want to emphasize now is that the whole reason for third party access is that without it, the internal market really would never have become a reality. And so this is why there's such a key focus on this concept for both transmission system grids and distribution system grids in the third package. So what, what does that mean then for grid managers? Well, it means that uh, when you get a request to use the system, you have to honour that request. And more than that, you have to treat each request on the same terms. You must not discriminate. Uh, therefore, if you're part of um, a large company that has supply interests as well as transmission interests, then you must treat a third party in the same way as you would treat the part of your company that's supplying energy to. That way you ensure there is no discrimination. So, in many ways, it's a fairly straightforward concept. The European Court has, however, decided or rules, I should say, that the um, concept only relates to actual access to the system and it doesn't cover a related issue, connection. Obviously, many uh, new facilities, let's say a new power plant, uh, a new CHP plant, combined uh, heat and power plant, uh, have to be connected to a grid or a new wind farm, for example. They have to be uh, connected to a grid to supply final customers. The concept of third party access, however, does not cover connection as such. This is regulated by other provisions in 
the directives. And there is no requirement to provide automatically a connection to anybody who asks for it. In fact, this is usually governed by national law, the aspect of, of connection, so that um, it's possible for transmission system operators in accordance with national law to decide who pays for new connections. For example, a large wind firm somewhere out in the middle of the North Sea wants to run uh, a cable to connect into the grid in Germany or in the Netherlands or in Belgium. Now, that will be a costly exercise. And, of course, when it comes to costs, it's always important to know who's going to take up those costs. So this is something that the, the directives don't really actually provide much guidance for us. We have to look to national law. And in the first part of my lecture on the third package, I explained that when it comes to directives, member states have a choice as the way they implement those measures. And therefore, this is an important area, connection charges, where member states can exercise choice. And it's up to the member state to decide, well, is it the user, that is the, the wind farm in my example, who will pay the connection charges, or will these connection charges be socialised through those using the grid network? So this is an, a good example of where the directive leaves choice in how member states decide to arrange matters. So third party access then, it relates to the actual use of a grid. Once you're connected to it, then you have the right to use the grid. But it doesn't extend as far as the connection. And therefore, to understand how the third package here works, one has to look carefully at the interrelationship between European law, the directives themselves, and national law, the rules relating to, for example, connection charges. The second principle that I want to talk about in this part of the lecture is the principle of unbundling. This is a rather ugly word, unbundling. Uh, and again, however, it's a very important concept in European energy market law. <coughs> unbundling means that certain functions uh, that were in the past offered by single companies have to be uh, parceled out, have to be separated out. And in particular, the function of transportation or transmission has to be unbundled or separated from all the other parts or all the other functions of a vertically en uh, integrated energy company. So where, for example, a large company, let's say EDF or E.ON, uh, in the past would be supplying electricity or gas, but would also own and operate uh, networks, pipelines and grids, for example. In accordance with the principle of unbundling, the transmission part of these functions have to be, has to be separated out and operated independently. This relates then also to this first principle I talked about, third party access, uh, because in order to ensure that new entrants are treated fairly, uh, European legislation ensures that the party responsible for the grid, the TSO, the transmission system operator, or the DSO, the distribution system operator, um, is able to act independently and in its own commercial interests and should not have to take into account the interests of the companies supplying the energy in question. So unbundling then is related to this concept of third party access and it's there because the Commission looked at how the market was evolving and when it adopted the third package it wanted to make sure that this independent component was really strengthened and that's why in the third package unbundling um, has become a central issue. Now for transmission operators the unbundling rules are quite strict. Um, the Commission puts emphasis on what it calls structural or ownership unbundling. This means that the transmission pipelines or networks should in fact be owned and operated by a completely separate entity with its own resources, its own management, its own executive and there should be no relationships of interdependence between 
this TSO, this transmission system operator, and any other part of the energy supply or production business. So the rules on unbundling for TSOs are, are particularly strict. And the Commission in the third package has provided very detailed rules uh, to ensure complete independence. So, for example, um, if a TSO wanted to procure uh, IT services, uh, it must go to the market and do this completely independently of any parent company. It can't use the same IT services as uh, the parent company. So in, in my examples, the EONs and the EDFs of this world are not then allowed to use uh, the same IT supplier or indeed the same accountants or for that matter, the same legal advisors. So this is a very, very important principle to make sure that the TSOs function, you could say, as a kind of uh, motorway throughout Europe uh, to ensure that energy flows across these motorway networks without any interference from anybody else. For distribution system operators, the principle of unbundling is also of importance, but it, the, the, the package here is not so rigorous. Uh, this is because distribution system operators are often small, uh, and maybe it's not economically viable to start splitting them up into separate functional areas. However, the directives still require that the DSO must function independently. It must be constituted as a legally separate company and it must have sufficient resources, it must have sufficiently independent management to take its own decisions. So for DSOs, it's not a requirement that the transmission system um, is separately owned uh, ownership is not the issue, it's more the functioning, the management. And it's important then that these distribution networks are managed independently of any other interests. So these are two really fundamental pillars of the third package. And the rules in the third package to achieve unbundling, to ensure uh, third party access, are very elaborate. And However, because they're enshrined in directives, there's still uh, the possibility for member states to embellish on those rules and provide, if you like, their own way of interpreting them. The key uh, principle, again, as I explained in the first part of the lecture, however, is that although the member states have some flexibility, some freedom as to how they interpret these roles, the ultimate goals of the directives must still be secured. So, therefore, we have to look to understand the, the obligations, the duties on grid managers. We have to look at both the European level and the national level to see the entire picture. Thank you very much.